Hey guys, Mr. Backerberg here. This is lesson 2.1. We're going to focus on describing patterns and using inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is reasoning based on evidence, and we use that type of reasoning to help us make a conjecture. What a conjecture is, is it's an unproven statement or conclusion based on some observations or that evidence that we were looking at. In this example, we're looking at a few different diagrams or pictures, and what we want to do is, based on the evidence that we have in front of us, we want to figure out what we think the next figure in the picture would look like. So if we look at this first circle on the far left-hand side, we've got a circle that's split into two pieces with one of them filled in. If we look at our next figure over, we've got a circle split into four pieces with one of them filled in. Going to the next one over, we've got a circle split into six pieces with one of them filled in. So we're following a pattern here. Our first circle was two pieces with one of them filled in. Our second circle was four pieces. Our third circle was six pieces. So my guess would be that our next circle is going to have eight pieces to it. But there will be one of those pieces colored in. And if we take a look at the picture, there it is circle split into eight pieces with one of those pieces filled in. In our next example, we're looking at a group of numbers and we're trying to figure out the pattern with those numbers and then we're gonna fill in the next three numbers in that pattern. So we start with negative seven, then we go to negative 21, then negative 63, then negative 189. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what the pattern is between these numbers. And if I look between seven and negative 21, to me it looks like we're multiplying by three. So let's check that out with the next one. If we take negative 21 times three, hopefully we're gonna get that negative 63. And if we check it out, we do. So we're multiplying by three there, and this next one is also going to be a multiplication by three. So if we want to continue this pattern, what we're gonna do is we're just going to keep multiplying by three. So if we take negative 189 and multiply that by three, the next number we get in the pattern would be negative 567. And then if we multiply that one by three, we're gonna end up with negative 1701. And then we'll need to do this multiplication one more time. So one more multiplication by three, and we get negative 5,103 as our third number in that pattern. In this example, we're looking at five collinear points, and we wanna make a conjecture about the number of ways that we could connect different pairs of points. But we're not gonna jump straight to five collinear points. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with one point, and try to figure out how many connections can be made there. Then we'll jump up to two points and see how many connections can be made there. And we'll keep building this up to try to figure out if there's a pattern in what this would look like. So if we were just looking at one point, then the picture of it would look something like this where we've got just a single dot. And since there aren't any other dots, there's no other points, there aren't any connections that we can make. So there are zero connections there. But if we bump up to two points, so we've got a point here and a point here, then we can connect them with a single line. So there is one connection that we can make in this picture. If we jump up to three points, we add some more connections that we can make. We could connect the first and second points. We could connect the second and third points and we could also connect the first and third points. So there are three total connections that can be made there. If we jump up to four points, again, we're gonna add more connections that can be made. So we could connect the first and second points. We could connect points two and three, points three and four. We could connect point one to point three. We could also connect point one to point four and we could connect point two to point four. So if we count them up, we've got six different connections that we've made. Now I'm not gonna draw out the picture for five, I'm gonna see if we can see a pattern developing first. So if we look at the number of connections that were made, going from zero connections to one, then going from one to three and from three to six, we're trying to figure out what's the pattern that's going on. And as I look going from zero to one, it looks like we added one connection. But then as we move from one to three, we added two connections. Moving from three to six, we added three connections. 
So if this is going to continue the pattern, I would guess that we would add four connections. So we'll draw the picture and see what happens. So we've got one, two, three, four, five points, and we're going to look at the number of connections. So we can connect points one and point two. We can connect point two and point three, three and four, four and five. And then if we go point one to point three, point one to point four, and then we can go point one to point five, then we can connect point two directly to point four and point two directly to point five. And then there's one more connection that we're missing. I'm going to switch colors here so it's easier to see. We can connect point three directly to point five. So now if we count all of these up, it looks like there are 10 different connections that we can make. And that does follow our pattern. The six plus the four would give us 10 connections. So now we're going to jump that up just a little bit. Instead of being given five collinear points, now we've got seven collinear points. So based on that pattern and that conjecture that we made on the last slide, we want to try to figure out how many different connections we can make here. So in our last picture, when we had five collinear points, there were 10 connections that can be made. And I guess following the pattern, we added four to get to the 10. So my next one, I'm guessing that we would add five as soon as we get six collinear points. So it would be 15 connections there. And then if we kept going with that pattern, we'd add six this time. So when we get to seven collinear points, my conjecture would be that there are going to be 21 different connections, different ways to pair those things. Our next example says that numbers such as 3, 4, and 5 are called consecutive integers. So what we're going to do is we're going to make and test a conjecture about the sum of any three consecutive integers. So for our first step, sort of like we did with that number of connections with those points, we're going to see if we can find a pattern using a few groups of smaller numbers. So I'm thinking let's try like 0, 1, and 2. Those are all consecutive integers. Now sum means that we're going to be adding these things together. So if we take 0 plus 1 plus 2, we get an answer of 3. Now if we try this out for another group, let's go with that 4 plus 5 plus 6. When we add all of those together, we get an answer of 15. And let's maybe throw one more group out there. Let's go with 7 plus 8 plus 9. And when we add all those things together, we get an answer of 24. And now we're trying to see if there's a pattern between the answers we got and the numbers that we were using. And what I'm focusing on is the middle number. Okay, To get this 3, if we were to take that middle number of 1 and multiply it by 3, that'd be another way of getting that answer of 3. And I want to see if that holds true for the next one. So our middle number was 5, and the answer we got was 15. Well, if we take 5 times 3, we're still going to get that 15 answer. And if we take a look at this last one, we had 8 as our middle number. And if we're looking at that 24, 8 times 3 is 24. So before we get on to step number 2, I'm going to write out what I think my conjecture is. So my conjecture is that the sum of three consecutive integers is the same thing as the middle number times three. So now what I want to do is I want to test that out to see if it holds true. So if we tried like 14 plus 15 plus 16, then based on my conjecture, we should be able to just take this middle number and multiply it by three. So we could take 15 times three. Well, if we add all of these together, we get 45. And if we take 15 times 3, we also get 45. So it holds true for that one. Let's try some even bigger numbers. Let's try 100 plus 101 plus 102. And my conjecture would say that we could just take 101 times 3 and also get the answer. Well, if we take 100 plus 101 plus 102, the answer we get is 303. Down here with my conjecture, if I take 101 times 3, I'm also going to get 303. Now our conjectures may not always work. And a counterexample is a specific example that shows that a conjecture is false or not true. 
So we've got a conjecture made about the sum of two numbers. And what we want to do is we want to see if we can find a counterexample that'll help us disprove this conjecture. So the conjecture that this person came up with said that the sum of two numbers is always greater than the larger number. So what we want to do is let's just start picking out examples and see if we can prove this to be false. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start adding numbers together. If we take 2 plus 7, the answer we get is 9. And our conjecture is that the answer is bigger than the larger of the original two numbers. Well, in this one, 9 is bigger than 7, so that works for this conjecture. So let's try out a different pair of numbers. Let's try 10 plus 27. Well, if we add those together, we get 37 and 37 is bigger than that 27, so that conjecture is still holding true. But what I want to do is I want to take 3 plus negative 2, because we can add negative numbers. Well, if we take 3 plus negative 2, the answer we get is going to be 1. And in this example, 1 is not bigger than 3. So this example right here is a counterexample because it shows that this conjecture isn't always true. The answer we got was not bigger than the larger of the first two numbers. Okay, one is not bigger than three, so this is actually a false conjecture. Our last example is also finding a counterexample to show that a conjecture is false. So the conjecture we're working with says the value of x squared is always greater than the value of our original x. So what I want you guys to do is pause the video and try to see if you can come up with a counterexample. And then once you're all done, start it back up to check your answers. So I guess let's just start squaring some numbers. If we took 2 and squared it, we'd get 4 and 4 is bigger than that original number 2. If we took 3 and squared it, the answer we'd get is 9. 9 is bigger than our original number of 3. Um, 10 squared is 100, and 100 is bigger than our original number of 10. In our last example, we used a negative to help us out. So let's maybe try a negative number. If we took negative 4 and squared it, we'd get 16. Well, 16 is still bigger than that negative 4 that we started with. The counterexample that I'm going to use is I'm going to take a half and square it. When we square a fraction, what we have to remember to do is to square the top number and square the bottom number. So if we square that 1 on top, we're going to get 1. And if we square that 2 on bottom, we get 4. And 1 fourth or 1 quarter is actually smaller than a half. So this is our counterexample. This example proves that our conjecture isn't always true. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.